my name is Jacob Mathis. I'm an engineer with the Metropolitan Sewer District and the project manager for the Portland CSL Basin, which we are here to talk about tonight. And I'd like to go ahead and recognize uh, a guest uh, today, Marty Storch, Assistant Director with Public Works. He'll be here for any questions or answers at the end of the meeting. Um, go ahead and get started. A few things we're going to talk about tonight. I want to let you all know that this meeting is being taped for Metro TV, so if you would take the time right now to silence or turn off your cell phones for me, I'd appreciate it. And also, since it is being taped, we're going to ask that you hold all questions until the end. There should be uh, little index cards for you to write your questions on. We'll collect those at the end of the presentation, and we'll go through and read those and answer your questions accordingly. But what we're going to talk about today is Portland CSO Basin. We're going to talk about while we're here, the public outreach process, the project itself, it's, uh, with some specific details. Uh, we're going to do a question and answer session to get some, to know some information about the people in our audience today, and then we're going to collect some additional feedback. We're here to mitigate the problem that we have. Uh, as you know, anytime we get a significant rain, like we had about an hour ago, anything over a tenth of an inch typically results in an overflow. So at some point somewhere in your community right now, there's probably a sewer that is overflowing. And if you look at this slide here, uh, you can see it's a community-wide problem. It's not specific to the Portland community. Um, the blue dots that you see are those within the combined sewer service area, and the yellow dots are outside in the sanitary sewer system. Uh, the way we're going to mitigate this is with our consent decree program, which is about an $850 million program of capital projects that we have planned. The largest portion of those projects are our CSO storage basins. As you can see, they're not in the Portland community specifically. They're spread out through the Louisville metro area. And the consent decree program, it started roughly around 2007. Um, we're currently in the third phase, which is the combined sewer system projects. Started about 2015 and will last to about 2020. And it's about a $400 million capital investment on our part. For these projects that we have, we have a public outreach process. And it consists of four phases. The first one was the orientation phase, which was held in February 2015 at Western Middle School. That's where we come out, give you a brief background of our integrated overflow abatement plan to tell you what the issue is and what we're trying to correct. The second, step, uh, I guess, phase of that is the conceptual design plan. We were here at the Neighborhood House in 20, uh, January 2016 to give you a more detailed information about the specific project. It wasn't designed at that point in time, it was just the project parameters itself and roughly where it was going to go in the community. So tonight we're in an advanced design stage. We have a design that we're going to share with you all uh, regarding the project. We're going to collect some information from you all to help us further that design. And as we move forward, when we get to construction, we will have a fourth meeting to introduce you all to the contractor, let you all know uh, the schedule and how it's going to impact the community as the project moves forward. So right now, what I'm going to do is pass the uh, presentation over to uh, Bob Woosley with Heritage Engineering, which is our consultant for this project. All right. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> did I just hit the arrows here? Got it. Got it. Okay, I'm going to give you some details about the basin project. For those of you, how many of you were actually here last time? Most of you, some of you, some of you weren't. Well, uh, we looked at many locations uh, for the basin uh, within the Portland area and settled on Landon Park. So if you weren't here last time, you didn't get to hear the details of how we got to that. But at this point in time, we are in Landon Park, and I'm going to show you how that fits in. Um, first of all, what is a CSO basin? A lot of acronyms. It's a combined sewer overflow basin. Uh, what that means is it's meant to temporarily hold the sanitary sewer flow until the sewer can, system can hold it or handle it. So in this case, we have a basin that will be underground, not above ground. Uh, and when the rain subsides and we can get it back into the sewer system, we'll pump it back into the system. And I'm going to give you some, some uh, other information here in a minute about that. A few of the questions that are always asked are, <clears throat> will this create a potential for backups in my basement or in my house? 
Uh, if you're holding water in the system, what's that going to do to the rest of the system? Where's the water going to go? Well, it will not because we're designing those systems in place to where it's only going to hold a maximum amount that is below the lowest opening elevation um, in the system. So hydraulically, and we talked about this last time, but we can only put it in certain areas of the drainage shed. We can't just arbitrarily pick a location because it, it may be outside of the hydraulic range that we need it to be in. So in that regard, that's not a concern at all. Uh, if the basin is full and this type of rain event that we just had happens and continues to happen and over and over and over, and we, we go through three or four days of this type of rain, we'll continue to have overflows as we always have. We'll hold back as much as we can, but we will have overflows if that happens. So it's, it's still going to operate the same way. Uh, does it reduce flooding? Well, that's a, that's a tough one. Uh, it will increase the capacity of the system, but not necessarily always reduce surface flooding. We're intending to only reduce the amount of overflows into the rivers and streams. Uh, is it going to be visible? And that's a big key, uh, and I'm going to show you some renderings of what it's going to look like. You will see some structures in the park. You won't see the basin. The basin will be below the gra grass surface. It'll be an underground facility, and that's where everything's stored. But we will have a control building. Uh, which is, if you're familiar with uh, any of our flood pumping stations, it'll look like that. It'll be a, it'll be a uh, more or less a garage type facility with, a, with an awning or a, a, a covering on it. And I'll show you a rendering of what that looks like. Uh, what about the odor? Will we have an odor? Is there going to be a potential for an odor? Uh, we do not feel there's going to be potential for odor or there, there will be odor. However, as part of this and all the basin projects, the, uh, the system is being designed so that it can be added at any, at any time. So we're, we're factoring that in where we can bring odor mitigation facilities online if we need to. We, we really don't anticipate that being a concern because it's highly diluted. Uh, it's, it's mainly rainwater, not sanitary. Uh, and we've traveled around, looked at different communities and, and those that are within residential areas and, and it has not been a problem there. So we don't anticipate that to be a concern. But again, we are designing for it if, if it needs to be added. Okay, and I don't want to get carried away with this, but I talked about where it could go and where we put it. This is just the red line is, is the outline of the hydraulic area of the sanitary sewer shed that's connected to this system that we're trying to mitigate overflows. CSO 19, that's the combined sewer overflow number 19 within MSD system. That's the location where it overflows to the river. And that location, just to give you an, an idea, that's near uh, 34th Street, the end of 34th Street. If you went through the flood wall, there's a structure there that today, with this rain event, likely was overflowing and you would see flow going out to the river. On a dry day, it doesn't do that. But that's, that's the area that we have to, to mitigate to keep, keep from overflowing. Well, anywhere within this red box is where we were looking at trying to make, well, not anywhere, but within this red box red outlined area, we were looking at locations that were feasible. Uh, we settled on after a lengthy process and review of putting it in Lanham Park. And that's where you see to the right hand side there where it says CSO Basin. Uh, that's the entrance or near the entrance to Lanham Park itself. CSO 19 today, uh, that red area you saw covers about 850 acres. Uh, in a typical year you get about 61 overflows, meaning the, the flow exceeds the capacity of the sewer, dumps straight to the river. Uh, that represents about 167 million gallons of flow going into the river, and that's just from this one location. Uh, by doing this project that MSD is implementing, the benefits will be that we're going to go from 61 overflows in a typical year to eight. We're going to drastically reduce that, uh, basically taking 86% of that flow out of the rivers and streams. It represents about 6.7 million gallons of storage that's all underground and all covered. So just to give you an idea, that's, that's a lot of water. All right, a little bit about the basin. And this is some things that hopefully you'll be, I'm sure you're very interested in. Uh, this is the entrance to Landon Park. And give you your, your batteries here. Northwestern Park right here. 27th Street, as you come in, you can go straight through to the underpass to that up, or you can keep going to the right and get into the park. You veer off to the left to go to McAlpin or you keep going into the park. And this is the storage area that's fenced in today. That will be the location of the basin. So we talked about that briefly last time, but that was a 
potential site we were looking at, it's going to go within that fenced-in storage area. Uh, with that, we're keeping all our construction from the tennis courts to the west. And we're going to use this for staging area, meaning staging during construction. You have to have a place to lay down all your equipment where you can work and dig and store materials. Now, with that said, the park will never be closed. We're going to keep the park open at all times during uh, this project. So that was a little bit of a challenge, and I'm going to talk about how we got around that challenge uh, to help keep the park open and, and keep it uh, accessible to users. Uh, this is what it looks like today. I'm, I'm showing you things. You, hopefully, I know that's hard to see with the lights, but you guys have been out there and seen it. As you come into the park, you can go straight to the, you stay on the right-hand side, you go into the park, you veer to the left, and you go to McAlpin and lg e as well. If you're not familiar with that, the hydroelectric plant's over there. Just another picture as you're into the park itself, um, the uh, fenced-in area. All right. This is what we're looking at as our proposed layout. And if you see this, I'll explain what some of the colors mean. Uh, I know the, it's hard to see some of the colors, but uh, Northwestern, 27th Street comes in, and then the old road today, or the, not the old, the existing road today, keeps going straight into the park, and then there's this little piece that forms this triangle. We're going to abandon and get rid of that and turn all this back into green space, and we're going to rebuild the entire road as it comes into the park, move it over closer to the interstate right-of-way fence to maximize the green space when we're finished. And at the same time, we'll keep the piece that's going into, going into uh, LG and &E and McAlvin. As part of that, we've met with uh, Metro Public Works and Metro Parks, and we've decided and agreed that we would build a sidewalk parallel or alongside the road into the park because today as you guys know there is no sidewalk to get into the park unless you go to the eastern end of the park and you use the, the catwalk over the interstate uh, so we'll have a sidewalk connected to it at the same time and then uh, one of the features that uh, we will be putting into the park in some fashion is some type of uh, surface rain garden uh, that will be plants and plantings and we're going to work with metro parks on that uh, that's a water quality feature that uh, MSD is now working into many of the projects for surface drains. It has nothing to do with the combined sewer system. It's all for surface. And it's trying to keep some of that rainwater from getting into the sewer system to begin with. And, and the plants can absorb the, uh, and it, it'll be a nice amenity. Um, but everything that we have colored here, and I'm going to show you another inning in a second, is the hard surface. So that would be your, your paved road coming in your sidewalk coming in, and then we're going to connect somewhere near the tennis courts, and uh, we're working with Metro Parks on that location, but it'll probably be right, right by the tennis courts. We'll be tying to the loop system, and you've got a nice connection there. Uh, this will um, basically be our, our border of construction. All of this will be returned to grass, and then you have the hard facilities that you'll see, and I'm going to show you rendering those in a minute, but you'll have a control building, and a canopy that sticks off of it because we have to have a, a, a crane system in there just so we can hoist pumps in and out of the ground when needed. Uh, you'll have some hatches. That's what this hatching is, is here for, hatches to, to get down below grade. And then some asphalt surface that'll be all fenced in. So you'll still have some fenced in area, um, but when we leave, you'll have more green space left behind than what is there today. And I think coming up next is just a blow up of that uh, same area that I was just pointing to. And the, the green, is it, it's, these are just colors just to show you on the screen, so don't, don't be alarmed if you say, well, it's such a bright green. It's just a, the roofing system there. So, All right. Um, this is just an exhibit to show as best we could what it's going to look like. We took a, uh, a Google image, you just took an aerial image, so you can see what it is today. And when we leave the site, Roughly, this is what you're going to end up with in terms of green space. So you'll, you'll take what was a, a gravel lot that's fenced in, and this will be returned to green space. And then you, we'll have a little more asphalt back here around our control building. We'll have our sidewalk tied in. Tennis courts still stay there. We're not going to touch the tennis courts during construction. Um, I'll show you the next renderings we have here. This is a, an image we just put together to give you an idea 
of uh, what it's going to look like as you drive into the park when it's finished. Of course, this is when things are, have, have matured. Uh, is in, in th this is our conceptual idea of some plantings and some trees. We're, we're going to work with Metro Parks on this, but it gives you the idea of the scale of the building. And the next one will actually give you a better idea. Okay, this is standing on the flood wall as if you were looking back into the park. And don't pay, I don't want you to get lost in that, where's the tennis courts, where'd they go? I'm trying to give you the idea of the scale of what you're looking at in terms of the, the building. Here's, here's just a, a two scale, a truck that would be parked there. And then the, store, the control building and then a canopy over the top. So that's graphically or roughly what it's gonna look like when we leave. And then you'll have grass area around it. We'll have a controlled fence to keep people in and out of the, of the facility. All right, and I talked about keeping the park open. As part of this project, we broke it into two pieces. We have an interceptor that we have to relocate. Um, let me skip ahead, here we go. We have an interceptor that we have to relocate that runs right through the middle of our, of our basin location. So this interceptor, it's a large diameter sewer. An interceptor is nothing more than a large diameter sewer that collects all the flow that is conveying it from here to our flood pumping or to our sewer pumping station, which also serves as a flood pumping station at 34th Street, and then it takes it to the treatment plant. Well, that piece of sewer has to be moved out of our way. Uh, we broke this project into two parts. We we're going to do the interceptor relocation first, and then follow up and do the actual basin construction. By doing that, we can keep the park open during construction because once we move that out of our way, we can relocate the road at the same time get the roadway out of our way so that traffic can continue to move back and forth and then turn this whole area over to the contractor so that he can get in there and, and excavate and, and uh, fence it off and have at it so we can get it built. Um, and I'll go back to, yeah, there we go. The existing sewer, the size of it, and these are, aren't small sewers. It's a seven foot, four inch by eight foot, six inch sewer. So it's a large Zammer sewer and you can easily walk through it or drive through it. It is already underneath the park today. When we relocate that sewer, because uh, back in those days, that's a, a brick sewer. Uh, as many of you probably seen pictures of those historic pictures, but they're still in service today. They're not, I mean, those are uh, well beyond their lifespan, but they're still functional today. So that piece of sewer is being relocated. Uh, we're going to have four new structures we have to build. It's about 650 feet of, we're gonna put back 96 inch pipe. Uh, and it's 800 feet of roadway design, and then it ends up being about 2,700 feet of sidewalk when it's all said and done by the time we, we get out to Northwestern. And then just another picture of that. Uh, I wanted to show you that there are some other elements here. Uh, there's the 27th Street flood pumping station. There's some other pieces and parts. We're not touching those as part of this project, but they are there today, and they'll remain in service. We're not, we're not uh, getting rid of those. Okay, uh, do you want to take it? You want me to keep going? All right, our next steps is we are at this point continuing on with the interceptor project to get it ready for uh, construction to start in the fall. So you can see September of 2016, there's going to be some construction starting out of the park, and that's for this interceptor piece, the piece in yellow uh, that we're going to be building and, and relocating. At the same time as part of that, the roadway relocation work happens with that same contract. After that happens, uh, we'll follow up after the first of the year with the basin itself. Uh, and that's when, by then, we'll have the interceptor relocated, we'll have the road relocated, and we'll start in on the basin. Uh, we're gonna start on that in February, uh, followed right behind that with, the, they're gonna, coordinate, they're going to overlap, but they're going to complete basically at the same time the basin's starting. And then if all things go to, according to our schedule, we'll be finished with our construction of the basin in the fall of 2018, November 2018. Uh, our deadline that we have to finish by is December 31st, 2019, but we're trying, to, we're trying to give ourselves plenty of leeway there so that we don't push ourselves right up against the deadline. Is that good? Okay, at this point in time, we're gonna do a getting to know you portion. As each one of you all come in, you should have uh, been handed a clicker. If you have one, 
or if you don't have one, raise your hand, we'll get you one. Um, we're gonna go ahead and use these, uh, numbers one through nine are on here, so as the questions come up, you'll be able to respond as we go through here. I'm gonna hand you over to Dr. Ted Grossard, who will uh, conduct the polling portion. Thanks. Uh, just to orient you a little bit, um, you've just had a whole lot of information put in front of you, and so if you've got questions, that are swimming around in there, I would start getting them down on your cards. Because what we're gonna do at this moment, I'm gonna ask you a few questions. Questions we typically ask, I mean, who's in the room, age, gender, a few things. And we're also gonna ask you a few questions about things you'd like to see at the park, which is part of the reason we have Marty here, so we can have that discussion. Then at the end, other questions that you have for everyone to hear, we'll pick up those cards and they'll be addressed up here for the camera. So keep that in mind. So, for the moment, it's on you to answer some questions for us, okay? So, uh, how many of you have used these before? Okay, they're real simple, as you will see. There's just one through nine and a few things at the bottom that you don't have to worry about. I'm gonna, in a second, I'm gonna throw up the screen here and it's gonna ask you to enter a number and all you do is press a button and that's it. So it's real simple. For those of you that have friends, family, neighbors who couldn't come out tonight, I can't imagine why, um, please encourage them to navigate through the wind site to the Portland Basin. All of the questions I'm gonna ask you tonight, the whole presentation will be there, it'll be live in a few days as soon as we get tonight's data included in it. And we'll leave that open for several weeks because we really wanna find out um, where everybody is on this and we wanna get some feedback to inform um, the uses that might be at the park later. So please do that for us because it helps us a lot. Okay, so. So you see a question that says, how young are you? And I don't know if you, you can't really make out the funny little thing up in the corner, but it's actually right up here is a little bar that tells me that people are out there and they're entering, they're pressing uh, their keypads. So, as long as that little thing is green, it means this machine is listening to your keypad. If you, if you press the button, you should get a little green light, and it goes off after a couple seconds. If you don't get a green light, then let me know. We'll get you a different keypad. We got about a thousand of them. So, so is everybody good? So first question is simple. How old are you? How young are you? Is everybody, everybody in? Do you need a keypad? You can see the number changing up there. Okay, is everyone in? Okay. All right, that's it, that's how it works. So you can see we have folks in the 50 to 59 age. Okay, tougher question. Gender? Okay. How long have you lived in the Portland community? And if you haven't lived in the Portland community, then your answer is five. So press one if it's less than five years. So we have some long timers here. Okay, I'm gonna ask you a few questions about where you live, if you have a business, and where you spend your day. So we're gonna use this as our reference map. And just, just as a reference, so we'll be asking you to press in numbers one through five. Five would be, five would be somewhere outside of this area. But one is up next to the basin. This is 30th. This is Bank Street, this is 21st. Two is obviously 21st, um, to 21st to 30th. And this is Market Street, this is 15th up to 21st. And zone three is 30th and everything inside the loop. So everybody have your house spotted? Okay, so where do you live? 
And if you don't live in any of those colored areas, then it's a five. Okay, so we've got a few folks from outside the area, mostly one and two. So folks that live pretty close. Same question, where do you operate a business? So where do you operate a business? And if you don't operate a business, obviously you just press a five. Okay. And then, obviously, where do you spend your days? If you work, volunteer, go to school. And I'm going to make you choose one location. I realize you might be in more than one area. But. So a lot of folks spending their days nearby the park. Another thing, another thing that we're working on is how to get people to come to meetings, how to keep people informed. So we're going to ask you a couple questions. How did you hear about this meeting? And then the next question will be, ways that you'd like to get your information. So this is for our use going forward because we'd like to see this room full every time. So just take a look at these options. There's 10 of them. The 10, by the way, is the middle button on the bottom. Some of them may, may say zero, but that's actually a 10. And, and then press in four of them in any order. And if you change your mind or you get lost, just enter them again. The last four numbers that you press in are the ones that the software will hear. So. so in this group, the postcards worked. And apparently everybody was talking to everybody about it. The council district newsletter and MSD emails. I will tell you that they're working really hard on building a better email list. OK, so that's how you heard about this time. How would you like to learn about it? Now, kind of the first options are in the same order as the last one. And obviously, we can't control word of mouth, so that's not really an option. So, postcards, the council newsletters, the neighborhood association, public meetings, and the Metro TV videos. Okay. Good thing she's here. All right. So, thank you for all of that. That kind of helps us. Now, I've got a few questions here that we're going to ask you um, about how you use the park, um, how you get to the park, and things you'd like to see at the park. And when we get to that final one about what you'd like to see at the park, I'm going to ask Marty to just kind of discuss them so that you understand what they mean. And we're going to ask you what your preferences are about these things. So, uh, and, and that's because MSD is working on MOA with Metro Parks. And so this will help inform Metro Parks as they start thinking about what to put in this location once the basin is finished and the space is, as, as Bob has said, is we've left a space so that there are some options there. Okay. So first question is just how often do you use the park? Are you there every day? Are you there more or less every week? Do you only go in monthly? Or it's not really something that you use in this part, in this end of the park. So a lot of you are, about half of you are daily or weekly users. How do you get there? And in this case, you can choose a couple of ways because we assume you don't always get there the same way. Walk, bike, car, bus. I don't know what other is. Um, hovercraft, maybe. Okay. So four, five, six. Most of you always use a car. Most of you use a car, and about half of you will walk or bike there. Okay. So this is the question: How do you use the park now? And you can choose up to three of these. So these are things uh, that, based on what's at the park, are things that you could be doing now. So we're curious about how you use the park now. And again, up to three of them. So most popular use is using it to get to the river walk, to the levee trail. Next is walking or running itself. For those of you who put in other, what other uses? I'm just curious. Yes, sir? I'm sorry, you do what? Oh, over to help Little League? Okay. Right, okay. To go to work? <laughs> yes, you do. Parks aren't supposed to be a place. Oh, well, never mind. Uh, anyone else? Okay, it's uh, not a required response. I was just curious. We want this list to be as complete as we can. So, um, so here's the question about what improvements do you think would be most valuable at this portion of the park? And so we're not going to let you check all of them, all right? Because that's not fair. That's kind of like cheating. So, I don't, Marty, do you want to actually kind of discuss what these options are and while people are looking at them, thinking about them? Am I the only one that didn't know what a spray ground was before? Okay, so that's fine. If these, if you, if these all make sense to you, then choose the three that you'd most like to see. What would that be? More benches along the side. More benches? 
So we're going to call other benches. Okay. Okay. And and it's still open, but it's sorry, it's still open. But I would ask you to re-enter your choices. It'll hear the last three things, yet, so we won't have lost anything. But just re-enter, and we're going to consider other as additional benches. How's that? Okay. So drinking water is uh, popular. Let's see what's four: uh, restroom and playground. Those are our top three. And there's a couple of people that want benches. So. Thank you for that. Let me show you a second. We asked these questions of other folks, and I just kind of want to, just in the spirit of telling you other things that we've seen, and to emphasize to you, now your friends can go online and they can answer these questions too, so we can build a better database. But let me just show you for a second what other, what other people had said. Last time we were here, we talked about it. We asked how people got to the park. Again, car was the most common way. Uh, we asked folks about what they did at the park. It was focused on uh, running, and uh, just running or uh, getting to the walking trail. Uh, we asked folks about uh, park improvements last time. Their number one item was restrooms and a bicycle comfort station. Now, your data will be added to this data and we'll look for more data so that we get a clearer picture of what people's preferences are and then Marty can use that as they decide how they wanna make their improvements in the future. It's not that the thing that everyone votes for the most is definitely gonna get built but it helps us understand what's viable to folks and what's less viable, so it gives some guidance as they think about how to equip the park. So I think I'm gonna turn this back to Jacob. Thank you for your time. Jacob's gonna wrap this up and take your cards. Okay, uh, if you have a question written on a card, if you'd hold that up, someone will be by to collect it, and we will move forward with answering those questions. Okay, question number one. Are you going to maintain the shrubbery around the fence of the basin? It depends. Uh, currently, we have had discussion with Metro Parks about possibly transplanting some of the newer trees that were recently planted. If it is feasible to do so, we will do that as part of the project, either MSD or Metro Parks, if the season is appropriate. If it is out of season for transplanting of trees, the trees will be lost. However, we do plan on planting new vegetation around the the fence location kind of shown in the rendering. As we go through the design process and the uh, community facility review process, we will uh, develop a landscaping plan uh, that is in, in accordance with the land development code. Well, now that means if it's the correct season to transplant a tree, because the trees can only be typically moved in the fall or early spring. So if we get there and it's feasible to move them, we will move them if they will survive. If it's in the middle of the summer and it's hot, then they're not gonna survive without a lot of effort being expended towards it, so we'll just plant new ones. I just wanna expand on what he was saying there. There will not be an overall loss to the vegetation. Obviously, uh, 90 degree days, it's not the time to move trees at all. So hopefully, and I'll say this, MSD has been a great partner with us with the with the grants that they have given to us for planting of trees. We just did 450 trees in Sun Valley Park with them, and we're hoping to continue that partnership <clears throat> uh, as well, which means a lot to us because it really helps stretch our dollars, and we were able to buy some smaller trees, more of them, to put them in our nursery so they could grow a year or two so when we plant trees, it doesn't look like a twig and we have a better chance of survival. Right now, Masude and her uh, forestry team have about a 98% survival rate of the trees that they're planting, which is huge. And uh, I just received some pictures sitting there where we've lost several trees to this afternoon in some major parks. So it's a, uh, trees are always a big issue and uh, we'll, we'll work with our landscape architects as well to make sure we put the right trees and the right plant in the right spot. Well, we hope. No, no, no we, but we hope to have what, what is something that's easy to maintain so we don't have a situation when things get planted too close together sometimes or too close to uh, fences or, or, or roads. We hope that we, we do a better job with the future plantings in, in, the, in the area. Okay. You got it? Yes. Thanks. Okay, question number two. 
The original design suggested that the basin building would be minimal. It now seems to have become very large. While well, the, I guess, new need for a parking lot, fencing, and canopy. <clears throat> um, I think the overall footprint of the actual building uh, has relatively stayed the same. The canopy is a addition that was not shown previously. And I guess we can go back to that. Okay. The control building itself has relatively uh, remained unchanged, like I said. The canopy is a newer feature, and that is to house and, uh, the bridge crane that we'll have underneath of that canopy. And that uh, crane is, allows us to pull the pumps for maintenance or replacement if necessary, as well as the, the valves and the vault that are next to it. Uh, without the canopy, you would have this four-legged structure standing out there with a crane on it that would be unattractive to the park. So it does have a roof over it now. Um, that's the purpose for that. And the parking area, we always plan on a parking area, but the parking area has to be large enough for our trucks to maneuver when they come in. Because they have to be able to pull in and back under the canopy to receive the pumps or the valves as they come out of the valve, um, and then be able to pull out of that area as well. So that's the need for the uh, pavement area, and it's as small as possible for our trucks. Yeah, we, we pulled it over as tight as we could get it to the club walk, which is that lower fence line there. So we pulled it over as close as we could get to the club wall without getting into the club wall. So we've been working with the Corps of Engineers extremely close uh, and, and pulled this all over into what I want to call the corner of the park uh, and moved the road over as far as <coughs> we could get it to maximize that green space. So we tried to take into account we added a canopy, we need to get back some green space as best we can. So we tried to take all those things. I mean, how often will people even be there, though? I mean, the pumps, they shouldn't be going out. Now, it just seems like there will be a lot of, and that's a lot of space for, you know, once every couple of years for maintenance. Well, it's not every couple of years. Um, <clears throat> to address your point, it is an unmanned station, so it will operate on its own. But there are monthly maintenance things that have to be done, whether the station's used or not. So our crews will be there to inspect and do routine maintenance on a regular basis. Um, it's the purpose for that. So it's not like it's a parking lot where you're going to see MSD vehicles parked there overnight for long periods of time. It's not a storage lot. It's just a space where our trucks can get in and out and be out of the park and off the roadway. I got a question for the summer Right now, where the road is sitting, how close would it be to the existing road right now? Look like, it looks like you've got an awful lot of parking behind it. Yeah. Keep going. There's one more. Keep going. Hey. It, it, Jerry, it's... <coughs> I guess you want to rephrase yeah. the question. Yeah, uh, you're asking how close will the new you're road? Gonna, you're going to move the road. How how far will we move it? No, no. No. How close is the existing the building that you're going to put in now? How close is it to the existing road that exists right now? Yes. Okay, got it. Uh, that building will be roughly within about 20-ish feet, 25 feet of the existing road that cuts. No, no, I'm talking about the road going into the park. And the road coming into the park, you're, uh, this basin, to give you an idea, from side to side, that's about 250 feet. Okay. 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 So it's about, it's about 250 feet. Off that park road. Okay. But you're also going to move the existing road over, right? And have a correct. Road. That's correct. Yeah, the existing road, just to give you an idea. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, and we're going to pull that over to where it is. Yeah, for the most part, it touches the fence cool. that runs along the interstate. <clears throat> for the most part, it's not going to be right up against it. It's going to be close. Yeah, gives you an idea. Correct. Yeah. So there, you have a pretty big green space there. Would you just outline where the base and underground? Is? Yes, I can do that. I know it's kind of tough to see. There's a yellow dash line here. It's a circular basin. I don't know about. I mean, I forgot to even say that. It's a circular basin that'll be under the ground uh, that's, for the most part, sitting within the fenced-in area today. It's a little bit uh, uh, south of that area, but it's, for the most part, within the basin itself, or in the fenced-in area. Uh, we, we, we moved it as 
far to the west as we could get it uh, without getting into closing off these access roads. Because we had to maintain access to McAlpin at all times as well. Not only leaving the park open, we had to leave McAlpin open. Uh, as you guys, I'm sure, are aware, <clears throat> you can't use the 27th Street underpass for truck traffic. There's just not enough clearance. You know, it's, it's a low, low, uh, low clearance area. So we moved it as far as we could get it. I know at one time someone said, well, put it into the park, put it over here, put it up. We put it in an area that we thought was the less intrusive to the park, and at the end of the day, opened all of this back up for a lot of possibilities. Um, so that's, and we work with Metro Parks hand in hand on that, trying to. And that, and that you like it's a good fit. Yeah, I think so. Let me answer that. Yeah. And one other thing that uh, we, we touched on the last time we were here back in January is, again, the eyesore of the old rock from uh, the, the lock project that became the uh, storage catch-all for bleachers, rock, and other things. We'll go away. When that green space is returned, we're hoping that it is almost like a, a gathering area. I talked a little bit the last time about the flag, uh, kind of a memorial area, making sure that, we, I think we talked about it's like 12 different flags, all the armed forces, state, city, county, Portland. I found out from Gil Holland there is a Portland flag and so he's going to get me a copy of what they're using as the Portland flag. And if you have one at your house, Jerry, that you want to share, that'll be okay as well. But we really hope that the, uh, the little flag area, as you leave, as you come in or leave, that's what you'll see, especially at night. There'll be uplit, there'll be a plaza area, there'll be a gathering space and hopefully it'll get used uh, different times of the year for memorial type services. Uh, uh, you've got July 4th, you've got Memorial Day, you've got Veterans Day, you've got Flag Day, different things to be used there. We think it's gonna be a nice addition to that park and a very nice leave as you're leaving the city or coming to the city, especially at night, you will see that and hopefully it draws some attention to that and people uh, get off uh, 22nd and come back around. Yes, you have a question? Have you guys thought about the type of fencing or security you're going to put around that? Is or is it going to be open? Or? Uh, around the facility? Yeah. Currently, it's shown as a chain link fence. The exact design has not been decided at this point. Um, it's something we'll work with Parks on the final appearance of it. Is there a thought you had? <clears throat> yeah, at this point, it was just a six foot tall. Yeah, and typically we do inst install a coated fence, whether it be green or brown or some other color. They got several different grades, and I know several different places where it's up in the city, it don't work very well. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Then we'll move forward. Well, it's got a question block over there. <clears throat> Let's just do this. Let's go to the end. Anything I need to do for the polling? No, just click forward. Okay, we have one last question for you all. I'd like to know how satisfied you are with this method of presentation. You got your selections from very unsatisfied to very satisfied, one through nine. You only get one choice on this one, so if you go ahead and enter those now. Everybody got theirs in? Uh, looks like we're satisfied. 
All right. If you'd like to know more about the project itself or get the presentations or Metro TV's video from the orientation meeting or the conceptual design meeting that was previously held, those are, can be located on the Project Win website. If you just search Portland CSL Basin, it should take you to the page. The presentation and video from tonight's presentation will be uploaded shortly along with the survey. So if you wanna, once again, remind your friends, family, or neighbors so we can gather their input. All right, how can you learn more about our public meetings? MSD has started using Eventbrite. Some of you all may have used that tonight. Uh, it's a way to sign up and receive notifications on this project. Uh, that way, any future meetings we have, we have your email address and we can go ahead and directly send you an invitation to that meeting. Uh, you'll be able to RSVP by selecting attending, may attend, or not attending. And if you are unable to attend and you register as not attending, you will get a follow-up email with the uh, link to the survey on there so you can provide your input. Uh, if you have any general questions or emergencies, you're always asked to call MSD's customer service at the number shown. Uh, calls will be answered by staff uh, around the clock every day of the year. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.